Okay, thanks, Dan, and uh, thanks to the organizers for the invitation and the opportunity to do this remotely. Although, uh, look, judging from the program, which is most of the program is taking place in the wee hours of the morning here, there's a lot of interesting talks, so there are some drawbacks to doing a remote presentation. Uh, what I'm going to talk about here is uh, some work that uh, I've been doing with Davide Farnokia, the next speaker. And uh, it's sort of a story of two spacecrafts and an asteroid. Um, there's the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft is the asteroid sample return mission that's been um, given the go-ahead by NASA. There's a mission concept called ISIS, which is uh, to send an impactor to the OSIRIS-REx target asteroid while OSIRIS-REx is watching. And the target asteroid is Bennu. And uh, not by accident, all of these names are taken from the Egyptian mythology, which is its own story. I'm not going to be able to spend much time talking about these missions. I'm going to talk about uh, the asteroid. But that's the sort of the backstory here. So let's see how, how do I advance. There we go. Uh, so Bennu is a potentially hazardous asteroid. It is the target of OSIRIS-REx mission, as I mentioned, and it's got a very well-constrained orbit. We've got 14 years of optical tracking with some of very high precision observations there. Even more important are the three apparitions from Goldstone and Arecibo with high precision ranging. And uh, so this allows us to compute the trajectory of Bennu with uh, the orbital uncertainty, for instance, of only six meters in semi-major axis. That uh, translates to a, an uncertainty in the orbital period of about two milliseconds for, a, I think it's a 1.2 year orbital period. Um, now that, of course, is not the position uncertainty, but the position uncertainty of the asteroid is actually quite good, is at the few kilometer level uh, at the current time. So what we have is a very precise orbit for this asteroid, which allows us to look further out into the future than we can for most asteroids. What we're looking at here is a plot, uh, a time history of what we call the MOID, the minimum orbit intersection distance. This is essentially the, the minimum separation between the orbital ellipse of the Earth and the orbital ellipse of the asteroid. And you can see well, there's, some, uh, there's some periodic terms there in the, in the evolution, but there's a big trend, which is essentially a node crossing, that brings this MOID to around zero from around 2100 to, to 2250. The dashed line there at the bottom is the um, radius of the Earth. And so any of these points down here um, permit an impact only because the, the ellipses are crossing, not necessarily saying that the, the uh, timing is right for an impact. So basically starting now, here's the lunar distance. And start, starting now for the next three or 400 years, we can have encounters within the lunar distance. And impacts are possible from 2100 to 2250, roughly. We can also look uh, at the precise propagation and see what's really there, not just the MOID, but the actual encounters. And the blue line is pretty much where we are. And looking forward, you can see that there's, um, there's a couple of close approaches here. Uh, in 2135, I'd like to especially point out, there's a close approach within the lunar distance and with the uncertainty of only about, uh, well, that's 5,000 seconds, so maybe an hour and a half in the time of closest approach. Going back in time, we can actually go rather further until uh, 1654. That gives us uh, about 481 years of prediction beyond which these scattering close approaches really obscure the trajectory of the asteroid. If you look after 2135, the orbital uncertainty, or rather the timing uncertainty for the next uh, close approach on the nominal trajectory is very large on the order of the orbital period, in fact. And so the asteroid could literally be anywhere on its orbit in 2163. Um, and so that's, that's, the, uh, that's the, the last point that we can really make good predictions is 2135 going forward. And so what we do is we look at the the B plane or the target plane in 2135 and we look for these keyholes. There's a kind of a, 
a schematic or cartoon on the left showing that if the asteroid passes at a certain distance from the Earth in 2135, it will have a certain period post-encounter that could bring it back in a resonant return to the Earth in a subsequent year. <coughs> in the middle here, we have this uh, B-plane depiction. Here's the Earth at the bottom and the positions. And I just have a, a graphic here to explain, make sure everybody understands what we're talking about, the B-plane or target plane, as it's sometimes called. Is you have this 3D error ellipsoid coming in and crossing this target plane that is oriented normal to the incoming hyperbolic asymptote of the asteroid. So if, uh, if this ellipse on the target plane falls on the Earth, then you have some possibility of a collision. So over here in 2135, we have, you can see we have the three sigma extent is here. The Earth is down here. There is no possibility of collision, but there is a possibility of a deflection onto a particular resonant period. And what we can do is bring up, uh, these are just uh, sort of schematic to give you an idea of what we call these Valsecchi circles. Now I understand uh, tomorrow morning Giovanni Valsecchi will be giving you the full explanation of what we call the Upic Valsecchi theory. And these Valsecchi circles are important here because they show where the keyholes are. If you pass through on this B plane, one of these circles, then you will come back some n years later for a another close approach and, in fact, an impact if you pass through the keyhole. So the intersection of this uncertainty region and these Valsecchi circles gives you the keyholes. I want to I want to point out this zeta parameter is one way of parametrizing this uncertainty space. It's also time. If you may recall, there were 5,000 seconds of uncertainty from nominal to one sigma. So this is something like a 30,000 seconds uh, uh, parameterization in time of arrival. But the zeta we'll come back to several times here. And you can see the, the scale here, we have to keep in mind, is about, uh, say, 400,000 or 350,000 kilometers in zeta. So if we take that zeta and, and look and map these keyholes what we, and, and map that uncertainty, this is essentially a, um, a more complete depiction of the previous slide where we have our zeta here and we have the keyholes which are marked by these uh, tall, tall um, lines. This marks the, the location and the width of the keyhole is on the left. So you have a keyhole here, 2185, and there's the width. At the same time, we can plot the probability distribution in the zeta space based on our current orbital uncertainties. And that's on the left axis. So what you have is a very elegant, I think, depiction where you can take, for example, let's just look at this 2175 keyhole. The width there is about 17 kilometers and it crosses the, the, the probability density at that value of zeta is 2.5 times 10 to the minus 6. And so you can immediately compute the impact probability for that keyhole of 4 times 10 to the minus 5. So this, um, this is kind of a complete picture of what's happening on the B plane in 2135. It gives all the salient information. Um, important to emphasize, these keyholes are fixed. They're, like I say, the part of the fabric of the universe for this particular asteroid. The, Probability distribution, however, is not fixed. And as we learn more about the asteroid, for instance, through the Osiris Rex rendezvous, this probability distribution will collapse to some place uh, much narrower. And if it collapses here into one of these sparse areas, it will have less impact probability at the end. If it, cla if it collapses here, then we have actually more impact probability than we do now. Um, if you take all of these keyholes and, and figure out the impact probabilities. There's, there's several dozen of them and you can add them all together and you get something like 1 in 2700 impact odds for a, about a two decade period late in the next century. Okay, so moving on to uh, talk about the mitigation concepts. The OSIRIS-REx mission, the sample return mission is going ahead. It's well on its way. It's past their PDR and even CDR just last month. Um, there's a mission concept that would be a sort of a partner mission that has been proposed to send an impactor to that asteroid after OSIRIS-REx has collected the sample and while it's waiting for its injection back to Earth. Um, and that will help us uh, be beyond all the numerous scientific benefits there that would teach us how to deflect an asteroid demonstrate that capability and 
importantly measure the momentum imparted through the impact so we can get some information about the momentum enhancement from ejecta. So speaking on a very, the, assuming that the impactor comes straight in and hits the, the dead center of the asteroid, our, our, uh, for this, these simulations we're using an impact date of March 2021 and the impact velocity of 15 kilometers per second. Well, this is the change in velocity due just to the spacecraft momentum. You've got uh, the V infinity times this ratio, which happens to be about 10 to the minus 8. And so 10 to the minus 8 times your V infinity gives you uh, maybe a, a couple tenths of a millimeter per second deflection in the asteroid. That's just the spacecraft. If we want to talk about the ejecta that's coming back, in the direction the spacecraft came, then we have this momentum multiplier factor, beta, that actually is the ratio of the total momentum divided by the spacecraft momentum. And so this beta is the key term that's uh, really largely unknown for, for any asteroid. And, and uh, we expect from laboratory work and theoretical work that it should be pretty modest, one to three, where one is, is zero ejecta, two is essentially a uh, elastic collision uh, where the ejecta momentum matches the spacecraft momentum. We expect the value to be somewhere around 1.5 and, and maybe even uh, somewhat less than that. So if we look at uh, for this simple direct hit example, now we're looking at uh, Zeta 2135 on the left and the different values of beta. This is where we are now with no deflection in Zeta. And these are all the keyholes that are plotted as dashed lines. If beta is small between 1 and 2, it is fairly insensitive. The, the, the deflection there is going to be from here down to here. And as beta increases, it, uh, you get much more effect from that ejecta. OK, that's the simple problem. If we look at somewhat more complicated approach, uh, that would be the oblique impact. And here, the ejecta is coming off normal to the surface and uh, the, the impact of momentum of course is, is direct and so you have the possibility by targeting different places on the asteroid you can essentially direct the ejecta to the direction that you want to give yourself the most benefit. So here's the equation here. Um, I think it's, it's fairly self-explanatory. Here's the, the velocity uh, the momentum of the spacecraft and then this term is the ejecta and there's the normal direction for the surface location that you actually impact. So how can we uh, under, understand what this does to the defender's trajectory? Well, depending on where you hit, you're going to get a different delta V on the asteroid. And of course, it also depends on the value of beta. So here's an example for beta 1.5. And in, in our, for our simulations, the asteroid is uh, the spacecraft impactor is coming essentially from the sun, from the, from the in the radial direction. And so here's your radial, transverse, and out of plane or normal deflection in millimeters per second. And here is your 0.15 or 0.16 for the direct hit. That's the case we just looked at. And you have zero and zero for transverse and normal. <laughs> if you move to the edge of the asteroid, I, I should mention this is the figure of the asteroid. And we're assuming a spherical asteroid at this point, which is not such a bad approximation for Bennard. Um, you, move, you actually get less and less radial acceleration and more and more transverse acceleration. So if you hit it on the right, the ejecta comes off on the right and you push it to the left. Similarly, if you hit it in some sense on the bottom, you're pushing the bottom. You're pushing the bottom. Now, so this affects, the, this delta V affects where we arrive in 2135. So we can plot now those, the, the change in position in 2135 on the asteroid where, the, where we're talking about the impact location on the asteroid. Here is for beta 1.5, which is a fairly small va a value of beta. And you can see we can move it by uh, up to a couple hundred thousand kilometers, which is a couple of sigma at the current uncertainties, we can move the asteroid. If you have beta equal 2, you have much more ejecta. And if you hit it on the side over here on the right, for instance, you can see you can get up to upwards of a million or more kilometers of deflection in 2135 by hitting it on the side. 
So again, this points to the idea that we can choose where we strike the asteroid to, to get the asteroid where we want it to go. Now, I, I'm bringing up again this figure to re remind you what we're looking at. And um, so here's the keyholes, and this is Zeta. So instead of talking about Zeta, we can actually talk about the keyholes and map the positions of the keyholes onto the asteroid for these two different cases. And so in, in a sense, in, in a perfect world, if we know beta and um, we're able to control the spacecraft precisely, we can actually hit one of these blue locations on the asteroid and bring it to a keyhole in 2135 and a subsequent Earth impact. And the, ideally, of course, we would want to avoid the keyhole locations and so we would target one of the blank spaces. The difficulty is we don't know what beta is, and so it's, uh, it's very difficult at this stage to say where to hit. So to, to look at this question, if we just look at the equatorial region and, and, um, and ask the question, if we hit on the equator, where should we hit for different values of beta? Well, here is the, the equatorial position from minus 250 meters to plus 250 meters. And, and beta, and you can see that for these different values, there's all these keyholes, and you want to find a place, given that we don't know where beta is, but we can control our impact location, we want to hit in some area that has not so many blue dots. And that would be, for instance, there, um, just a little bit to the positive direction of the, on the equator, and you can zoom in and see that in that area, there's only one keyhole, that's a sort of a locus of points here, and it's a fairly small one. <clears throat> so it has a lower impact probability. And so from beta 1 to 2, this is a pretty pretty good place. In fact, if you, you could change the shape of this red rectangle, for instance, and come over here, if you were pretty sure it was less than 1.5, you might try and target right at the equator, and, and uh, that would minimize your chances. Again, we don't know what beta is, and so it's a challenge, but we can have an assumed distribution on beta. This is just a notional one, but it's probably one I think that most of the impact specialists would find reasonable. Is here on the left is a possible distribution of beta, and if we take this and convolve it with all of the possible keyhole locations, you can actually map out areas on the asteroid that are more likely and less likely to lead to impacts. And so, for instance, as I mentioned, if you hit right on the equator near zero, this is a light blue area, and it's actually quite favorable to hit here, as opposed to these red regions, which you would definitely want to avoid striking these regions, because that would give you an increased risk of impact. OK. Uh, so to summarize, uh, we have several potential impacts in the late in the next century. and the odds there of impact are 1 in 2,700. There is this proposed ISIS mission that could do a deflection experiment, and it, it would actually tell us a lot about how to deflect an asteroid that's really threatening us. And the deflection that we actually get depends on where we hit the asteroid with the ISIS spacecraft, and it also depends on the beta. Um, this concept permits us to guide the deflection by targeting the specific points on the asteroid. And since we don't know beta, we can do assume a distribution and identify favorable and less favorable locations on the impact uh, on the asteroid to impact. And that's where I'll stop.